almost every commentator that I've heard report about the vaccines being shipped and finally inoculated in people's arms, all of them seem to use the same metaphor. Ah, there's light at the end of the tunnel. This year has been a dark tunnel of a year. And we're probably in for, let's face it, six more months. It's a good metaphor, though, the, the dark tunnel for what is indicated to those who seek to understand the meaning and the purpose of life in places other than through the Lord and His Word. They will see only darkness and distress, the gloom of anguish. They will be thrust into thick darkness. It's a terrifying poor words used to describe darkness. But there was a great breakthrough. It came through Galilee, the Galilee of the nations is called here, the, the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. And that's why I think Christmas is a season of light. I love the lights at Christmas. I, I love what Phil did up here with, with the trees and the, you know, the lights we light for Advent and then finally the Christmas light and the lights and the lights in the windows and, and the lights in people's trees. I mean, it's, it's just a great celebration with, with light and that's as it should be. This is a season of light. This year, evidently, even the heavens are cooperating. Jupiter and Saturn came as close together as they get for, I guess it's 1200. And uh, some people said, well, it's, it's like a Christmas star. And perhaps it is. But uh, that's not even close to what the shepherds experienced. They saw light far more spectacular than we can imagine. Because this is what it says. An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The glory of the Lord. It's hard, it's impossible for us to imagine what that might have been like. The glory of the Lord shone around them. All we know is they were terrified. It was that spectacular, that awesome. But the angel said, don't be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy. For all the people to you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign that what I'm telling you is true. You will find a child. A child. Just a child? <laughs> all this excitement over the birth of a, of a child? Ah, uh, what a child. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's look at those four terms, those four phrases for this child. Wonderful Counselor. The word wonderful, when it's used in the Old Testament, implies the supernatural. It's wonderful. It's the proper use of the word awesome, which has become just so common for a lot of people. I love the story of uh, Samson's parents. You know, they were, they were told, first the mother and then the father, who was named Manoah, the father of Samson, that uh, they were going to have this boy. He was going to be very special. He was going to be a Nazarite. He was not to drink anything or even cut his hair. You know the story, I hope. And the angel of the Lord appeared, first to the mother and then to Manoah and the mother. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, and by the way, in the Old Testament, often when it uses angel of the Lord, somebody may be even higher up than an angel. It may have been the son of God in the Old Testament. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? so that we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? It 
it's too white here. And then, then Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. And he said to his wife, we shall surely die. For we've seen God. His name is Wonderful Counselor. Supernatural Counselor. Counsel that human beings just, just can't get. The people in Jesus' day were told were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority. Not as the scribes, not as others who taught them. He was the wonderful counselor. He was the mighty God. They were out on the sea, and a great windstorm arose as it can on the Sea of Galilee. It's down in a, in a bowl. And the waves beat into that boat. So the boat was already being swamped. And he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're, we're dying? He woke up. And he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And then the wind Cease, and it was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? So they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Mighty God, Jesus did only what God is able to do. Paralytic man was brought to Jesus, and Jesus said to him before he healed him, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes who were sitting there said, questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Mighty God. Everlasting Father. It's okay, I forgot to turn my phone off, and I'm just hoping it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a signal for everybody in the room? <laughs> Maybe we'll stop between Mighty God and Everlasting Father. Sure. <laughs> you never know. Usually in the morning at 9 o'clock, you don't have to worry. But in the evening, who knows? This, this wonderful term, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, everlasting. On one occasion, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, not I was, I am, the eternal I am, the, the name that God gave to Moses, what should I call you, I am, everlasting Father. Jesus said, I am the Father of one. He said to Philip, anyone has seen, now you have an opportunity to turn that off. <laughs> Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Wonderful counsel. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Now, where is that? We haven't had much peace issue. The world is almost continually at war somewhere. It is now. There is no peace. Where is this Prince of Peace? Well, Paul reminds us that those of us who know Christ have peace with God. Because Jesus came. We are justified by faith. Paul says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can have peace of mind and heart because of him. Peace I leave with you, Jesus said. My peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. You're not going to find it there yet. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And don't let them be afraid. He brought peace between people who are normally at odds with one another. I have friends who are on the opposite side of the political spectrum. 
for me. They're Christian brothers, and I love them, and they still love me, I think. I'm pretty sure they do. But Jesus especially brought peace between Jews and Gentiles. There just was a huge division between them. Jesus came, and Paul tells us again in Ephesians, and proclaimed peace to you who are far off, that's us, and peace to those who are near, that's the Jews. For through him we both have access to God through the Spirit. Someday, he will bring peace on earth. Goodwill to all those who are in his favor. Authority rests upon his shoulder. Isaiah says, and since his authority shall grow continually, there shall be endless peace with the throne of David and his kingdom. That peace comes with justice and righteousness. He will establish and uphold his kingdom with justice and righteousness from this time forward and forevermore, Isaiah tells us. Now and forever when he comes again and forevermore. God is where righteousness and justice meet. God is both just and righteous. In fact, in Hebrew, the words are very close together in meaning. Righteousness doesn't just mean, and it certainly doesn't mean holier than thou, and it doesn't just mean piety or some kind of morality. It has to do with relationships. Our relationship with our family members. Our relationship with God, our relationship with our neighbor, our relationship even with our enemy, Jesus said. That's righteousness. And justice, as you might suspect, has a forensic value, it has something to do with making good laws, it has something to do with judicial procedures, it has something to do with uh, as we always portray justice as blind. And of course, we're to reflect. Both of those things were to be equally concerned with both righteousness and justice. We will pursue justice in the public sphere, and righteousness in our relationships, God helping us. So he is the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the mighty God. He's the wonderful Counselor. And all of this that he gives, the peace that is coming, the peace that is now, is absolutely guaranteed. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, he's named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He will establish and uphold justice, righteousness, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. New Living Translation says, the passionate commitment of the Lord Almighty will guarantee this. 800 years before it happened, Isaiah spoke it, it had already happened. Did you notice the tenses here? For unto us the Son is given. It's already happened. Well, it hadn't happened, and it didn't happen for 800 years. But the prophet looked at it in the eyes of a prophet and said, there it is. I see it. God said it. God promised it. It's guaranteed. God has always guaranteed what he's promised. First to Abraham, I'll make a covenant with you, Abraham, and by which I'll guarantee to make you into a mighty nation. And at that, Abraham fell on his face. Psalm 111 7 says, All God does is just and good, and all his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true, to be obeyed faithfully with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people, and we know that best. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. Guaranteed. I love this verse in Romans 5, 16. The promise to us, for this reason, our salvation, our future, depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. And be guaranteed. If it depended on how good you were or how bad you weren't, it wouldn't be guaranteed. Muslims go to face God with shaking. How have I been weighed? 
Paul says, our faith in Jesus Christ gives us salvation by his grace. In other words, it's his work. It's all of him. So it's guaranteed because it doesn't depend on you. Just your trust in him. Our future's guaranteed. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, our dying bodies make us grow in size, not because we want to die. But we want to slip someday into those new bodies in the cross, so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up with everlasting life. God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he's given us his spirit. My body, your body's going to die, but if you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and I. That's guaranteed. And I trust that's your personal faith. You put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. You told him that. You made that person. You say, I want to follow you in my life. I want to be in darkness at all. I want to have that light that comes from following you. Christmas is God's proof. All his promises are guaranteed. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. He's named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, who will establish and uphold justice with righteousness in the zeal of the Lord of hosts. He guarantees it.